So I actually made this slide in Figma slides, <laughs> AKA slides. So I'm Meng, and I'm really excited to be here today. This is actually the biggest stage I've ever been to, and I'm really honored. So I moved to Singapore last year. It's been amazing to see how lively the design community is here. And coming from the freezing winters of Canada, it's wild to see that we have summer all year long. <laughs> I even get to work on a balcony, which is wild. And my, sorry, my kids are going to school uh, in Singapore, and they started speaking Singlish. <laughs> so today, we're going to explore the evolution of design tools, how they have transformed our roles, so the before and after, and how they enable us to do so much more today, both in design and in code. We're also going to explore AI, which might make you pause and ask, what is my role as a designer today? Will AI replace me? And you might ask the same as a developer, maybe the three developers here, as a UX designer, as a content writer. So let's take a look at the timeline. It all started about three decades ago with Photoshop. Most of us were graphic designers, and we work on a resolution of 640 by 480. Part of my identity back then <laughs> was to create forum signatures. Can you believe it? And Winamp skins. Some of those were serious awesome. And I even created mine. In fact, we love to come up with really dark and evil names. <laughs> and mine was Shadowness. <laughs> and believe it or not, I created an art community back then, and it grew to 50,000 users. I was quite proud. It doesn't sound like a lot today, to be fair, but it was huge back then. So I taught myself HTML and CSS using GeoCities and Microsoft front page. It was using WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get. And it created the most horrible code but as beginners, it was a great way to dabble into code. I don't know if you remember, but we used to do spacer.gif just to create flexible spacing. And then we had nine slice scaling just to create what we love as designers for rounded corners. And then we used tables. I know this would fuel some nightmares today, right? And then Flash came along. This is where I learned motion tweens, animations, action script, and adding annoying sounds to websites. <laughs> I was working on a 15-inch monitor in a warping 1024 by 768 on a Windows machine. So we were inspired by the Matrix, and I'm sure some of you can recognize Two Advanced Studios, one of the biggest inspiration in graphic design back then. While it produced some amazing websites and skins, there were also no standards. It was the wild, wild west. There were no rules, fonts were tiny, and low contrast, I'm sure the 
accessibility police would not like that. <laughs> Nothing was reusable. Performance was horrendous. People created some really bad designs. I mean, who still create these buttons like this? But, and I believe it was widely considered the dark age of design. So along with Flash came fireworks, which was an early version of today's modern tool like Figma. It was vector-based. It was made for the web. You could create pages and states. You could export to HTML and CSS. And it was widely loved by its core users. Eventually, though, Adobe bought Flash and fireworks. Steve Jobs wrote a famous letter, and we know what happened next. Sorry, Sho, who is the VP of product at Figma, I heard he was part of the fireworks team. So with the death of fireworks, it was natural that Sketch would become its replacement. And with the rise of the iPhone, many designers became user interface designers, not just for the web, but also for mobile devices. So Sketch was perfect for the job. It had components, constraints, and a healthy ecosystem of plugins, which gave birth to Craft, Zeppelin for content generation, prototyping, and developer handoff. And a little, little side story here. I started to write about Sketch when I worked in San Francisco, which was my dream job about a decade ago. And my blogs really took off. But then I got kicked out of the US because of visa issues. That's when I decided to travel for about two years. And then I wrote a book about design and code, which I only expected about a few hundreds to sell, to be fair. But eventually, it sold for 12,000 copies, and it gave birth to design code. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> then Figma enters the chat. It changed the game completely. I fell in love with it against my better judgment. I mean, how can you create a tool inside a browser? That's what I thought. Everyone loved native apps. It was more performant. It was more responsive, everything. But Figma changed everything, including what I thought to be a good product. And it was because it was cross-platforms. It had real-time collaboration. It has a free plan with unlimited drafts, which made it virtually free for most designers around the world. Before Figma, right, if you wanted to share your designs, you had to upload it to Dropbox, communicate on Slack, and hope for the best. If you wanted to prototype, you had to install Craft, you needed a developer handoff, you needed to install Zeppelin. But Figma had all of that. Isn't that amazing? Four major subscriptions in one single tool. And I wrote a blog post about it. Changed my life. I got to meet Dylan after this. And he told me that because of this post, they created a new department for content. And they sponsored a design system course which would receive millions of views and is still popular today. So thank you if you're one of those who took my course. I actually dodged a bullet because if Figma didn't sponsor this course, I would have gone with Envision. 
Thank you, Figma. <laughs> so that brings us to today. You would be hard pressed not to find a designer who's not using Figma. People are obsessed with Figma. In fact, a little bit too much. This happened during Dylan's keynote, right? And Dylan couldn't stop wanting to close it. So please, don't do this again. So shift number one, designers moved from graphic design to user interface design. Nowadays, designers are wearing multiple hats. They're not just creating static designs. They're also creating responsive layout, animations, and even some aspect of implementation. So before, we did everything in code, writing CSS styles from scratch, media queries, and testing on multiple browsers. At some point, honestly, I skipped Photoshop entirely and designed everything in the decoding tool. We had beautiful tools like Espresso, which allows me to create simple HTML sites and upload it to an FTP server. No complicated setup, and those were the simple days. Compared to the, today's comple com complex tool set, we have to install so many extensions, libraries, and frameworks that we have to learn and adapt. No wonder that designers are scared of code. I understand why, though, we move in this direction. We want web apps. We want animations that don't refresh every time that we click on a link. But now, with Figma, you can do all of that stuff directly in the design tool. And I think it's far more effective. And you can now create prototypes, interactive components. I think it's much better for productivity versus doing it directly in code. Design systems. We used to create a huge style guide. We had to document everything, color assets, measurements, and tell people in the team how to use them. A lot of meetings were wasted. But with dev mode, you can have variables, you can have that within a live URL. You can invite your developers to inspect. And with Code Connect, you can have a single source of truth where developers and designers can reference the same component. So before, I had to recreate all and every single component from scratch in CSS, do that in React, and then I don't know about you, but after a while, and if you haven't worked on a project for like three months, you come back and you just forget everything, how you organized. So dev mode can ex export everything to CSS, to Swift UI and Android, and you can bridge your Figma components with Code Connect. In fact, with Amazing plugins like Anima and Locofy, you can export to a multi page with interactions, HTML tags, React components. And I was able to create all of this just within Figma, everything that you see right here. So, shift number two designers are becoming increasingly more technical with code at their fingertip. And then there's artificial intelligence. We have ChatGPT that can answer any question that we have. We have GitHub Copilot that can code for us. Perplexity AI can search better than any Google search and without the ads. Midjourney can create images. Claude can create content and assets. In fact, I was able to create some of these icons. Typically, I would have to, we would do quite a bit of research. And if you give it some specs, like the size and the 
the width and all of that stuff, you can ha have AI help you. And of course, we have Figma AI. Sorry, I have to go a little bit fast. I'm already out of time. Can rename our layers. And so the third shift is that we have an assistant now. You are a design lead. You can lead with instructions. Of course, it comes with some side effects, hallucination and job worries. Might try to outsmart you, but it's worth it. Now, would you rather be the person who's moving the toilet or the person giving instructions? Of course, I say that with all the respect that I have for craftsmanship. But at the end of the day, we should focus on our personal emotions and craftsmanship and taste that we have honed over the years to be the designer of the future. The question is no longer if we should, or if designers should code or not. I think you can with AI. Your assistant can do 80% of the work, and we all know the last 20% is actually the most significant. So technology is advancing very quickly, and tools are getting more powerful. Being designer or any kind of creative professional has always been about more than just the tools. It's about solving problems, telling stories, and bringing ideas to life. It's about understanding human needs, emotions, and designing solutions that resonate. ChatGPT might have helped me with this one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.